Hello and welcome back to my channel. Now today I want to talk about a strange phenomenon that I feel I've noticed in popular culture in Britain and that is the disappearance from our mindset and our collective memory of certain major writers, poets, essayists, fiction writers who used to be conjurable names with the public. You could mention them and everyone knew who they were and what they stood for. You could make jokes about them in sitcoms and everyone would get the joke. But somehow they seem to have disappeared from our national consciousness. And I just wonder why. Is it because as time moves on, people don't read them anymore, they find them boring? Is it because of bad education? Is it because our culture is changing so that these writers are no longer liked anymore or no longer feel relevant anymore? Or are there other reasons? Are people deliberately sort of omitting them from our consciousness and our education? And I just wonder why these particular writers, who in their day were hugely important, and in my childhood were conjurable names, but now it seems to me are barely mentioned. Now the reason I did this video, I should say at the beginning, I studied English literature as a BA student back in the early 1990s. So I'm familiar with the history of English literature in a way that perhaps most people are not. That's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is writers that would be known to the general public, even outside sort of literary circles. And what made me think about this was I was reading a book by the French writer Heismans. Uh, it's a book called Against Nature. It's a very interesting novel. And it's about this guy. He sort of holds himself up in his chateau and leading this very decadent lifestyle. And he's looking through the literature of Europe. And he talks about Walter Scott, Sir Walter Scott even. And it struck me that, of course, he talked about Walter Scott. This is a book that's written at the turn of the century, the late 1890s. And for the century after Scott was writing, during that sort of 1810s period, things like Ivanhoe and Rob Roy, he was one of the major figures of European literature. He was hugely influential. If you'd asked someone in 1900, who are the great figures of English writing, they would have said, Shakespeare, Dickens, Milton, Scott. That's how important he was. For a century, perhaps a century and a half, Scott was one of the preeminent writers of European, not just British fiction, but European fiction. Does anyone read Scott these days? When was the last time you picked up a copy of Ivanhoe? But when I was a kid in the 70s, the BBC did regular adaptations. You'd have adaptations of Ivanhoe and Rob Roy. Now, who would think of doing an adaptation of Scott? The peculiar thing about Scott was that he was kind of dated even in his own time, because in uh, 19th century England, there was a vogue for looking back to medieval or fantastical times like Arthur, the Arthurian legends, or the classical period. That became a sort of literary conceit. In order to uh, look at the world now, you went back in time to the time you know, to this more simpler, more innocent, more beautiful, noble time. So in a kind of curious way, Scott's work was dated as it was at the time. Whereas now, where our artistic focus is so concentrated on the present and the future, that looking back is out of fashion intellectually. So someone looking back in the 1800s is even more out of fashion intellectually. And perhaps that's why Scott has fallen out of favour. But he was such an important figure why has he collapsed so much in our present imagination? Now let's go back to the previous century, the 1700s, and here there's major figures in English writing that are no longer discussed. For example, Richardson. Richardson was not just a major figure in the English novel with Pamela and Clarissa, which are gigantic if you've ever tried to approach them, they're huge. They're a terrifying thing for any literature student on their reading course. Oh, my God. Um, but you see, the thing is, Richardson was not just important for English literature. He was important for world literature because he was one of the key figures to develop the novel. And yet he's barely read anymore. Most people probably don't even know of his existence. When was the last time you saw an adaptation of his work? What happened to Richardson? I'm thinking also of Alexander Pope. Now... As a kid, right, Pope was one of the major English poets. Even as a child, before I'd even read Pope, you'd heard of Rape of the Lock. 
This was one of the most famous pieces of literature in England, right? It was the kind of thing, you know, that the two Ronnies, you know, or Morecambe and Wise, could make a joke about. And the audience knew the reference. Now, who reads Pope? I don't think he's even read much at university. What happened to Rape of the Lock? This was one of the key works of English literature. It was an inspiration for generations, about almost two centuries. Now it seems to be forgotten, just mouldering away in a dusty library somewhere. And then there's Gibbon, Edward Gibbon, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Again, this was one of the pillars of English letters, always quoted as one of the most important books ever written in the English language. It's a book that I think we kind of should be reading now with the decline of our Western civilization. But is it read anymore? Do people still study it at university? This was one of the most conjurable names. Everyone had heard of it, even if they'd never read it. No, I've never read a single page of it, but I feel guilty that I haven't. I think that it worries me that such a major work of English scholarship, history and letters now is almost completely forgotten. And finally, with the 1700s, we've got to mention the big one, the big guy. You know who I'm talking about. Dr. Johnson. Dr. Samuel Johnson. This is not some remote, obscure figure of English letters. This was the man who for two centuries epitomised English thought, Anglo-Saxon philosophy, our whole nature. You know the way that cricket is thought of as being a symbol of Englishness? Johnson was a symbol of Englishness. And yet now, what is Dr. Johnson? He's Best known, really, for Boswell's Life of Johnson. His, the, the, the biography, the famous biography written about him by his best friend who travelled with him. And if anything, he's best known now as a character in the Blackadder comedy series. Do you remember Robbie Coltrane portrayed him brilliantly? I have made a dictionary, sir. The big papery thing that I have put on the fire. You know, that's all he's known for. This was a guy who was an absolute pillar of English thinking. Now... He's barely read. You can go, still go and see his house, by the way, in the East End of London. It's near a rather wonderful old pub, the oldest pub um, in, in, in London, which is called the Cheshire Cheese. And it's still kept some of the original uh, decor. You can go in there and have a roast and some treacle pudding. And then you can go through this sort of network of lawyers' offices and barristers' offices, and you can find Dr Johnson's house. It's it's a very bare museum, there's not much in it, but it's, they've kept the house pretty much as it was. And outside there's a, there's a wonderful statue of his cat, and the quote underneath it by Johnson is, a very fine cat indeed, <laughs> which is a very Johnsonian thing to say. But what happened to Dr Johnson? Why don't we read Johnson anymore? And also, why isn't he a conjurable name? Why isn't he the bigger name as Shakespeare or Dickens or Milton? That's what bothers me. Let's move forward in time a little bit here. One of the major poets of the 1800s. You know, there's Byron, isn't there? There's Shelley, Keats, you know, Rossetti, Browning, the two Brownings. Swinburne. You read any book from the late 1800s through to the 1930s, Swinburne is always mentioned as a key figure of English letters. Who reads Swinburne anymore? Have you read Algernon Swinburne? No, neither have I. I was looking him up on Wikipedia before this uh, video, and um, apparently he was quite a character, old Algernon. He was interested in sadomasochism. He liked being flogged. You know, he was interested in all sorts of, in those days, decadent things like homosexuality and lesbianism. <gasps> you know, I mean, this stuff is ripe for the modern age. Yet who reads Swinburne anymore? But he was read by everyone. He was one of the major poets in English literature, but he seems to have vanished. Why? Another figure who's vanishing before our eyes, which in a way is kind of appropriate just for some of his literature, is G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton, for many years, was thought to be one of the great thinkers, not just a great writer, but a great thinker in English letters. Who reads Chesterton anymore? I was in the local um, second-hand bookshop the other day, and I just saw The Man Who Was Thursday, I've never read it before, and I just picked it up. And it just made me think of G.K. Chesterton. He's one of those names that was always connected, like Johnson, with English thinking. Now, barely read. I just want to know why. 
let's change tack a bit. Let's talk about some adventure novels. Now, when I was a kid growing up, there were certain adventure novels that boys and girls read. Or if they hadn't read them, they knew about them, like the Greek myths. And one of these was The Prisoner of Zender. Do you remember The Prisoner of Zender? Anthony Hope, written in 1894, I believe. And it's that story about this king of some middle, middle European kingdom. I think it's called Ruritania. He's drugged. Someone wants to take the throne from him and he's drugged on the night of his coronation. So a plucky young Englishman is put in his place to pretend to be the duke. It was the stuff of... It, it sort of influenced so many adventure stories and, and stories of, you know, dual identities and mistaken identities, you know. And, and it, it, was, it was remade loads of times. There were loads of versions of it. You know, it was the sort of thing... This is what I'm talking about, where a Doctor Who episode in the 1970s could pinch its plot and all the people in the audience, all the mums and dads, all the kids, all the teenagers knew they were pinching the plot. They knew the model, just as they knew when Doctor Who episodes pinched plots from Greek myth. You know, the, the, you know Theseus and the Minotaur and Ariadne, Jason and the Golden Fleece, Hercules' Twelve Labours. They knew this stuff. Do kids now know this stuff? Does anyone read The Prisoner of Zender anymore? Or even know the plot? What about our old friend Baroness Orksey and the Scarlet Pimpernel? They seek him here, they seek him there, they seek him everywhere. I remember that from my youth. I haven't heard that in about 40 years. But I remember it. The Scarlet Pimpernel, one of the great stories. I mean, the Carry On team even made a Carry On film about it. That's how knowable by the English audience it was. They knew that they could do a skit on it with Sid James playing the Pimpernel. It's actually quite amusing if you watch that movie. But now, the Scarlet Pimpernel, who's read that in years? Do you see it in bookshops? Do kids read it? What's happened to the Scarlet Pimpernel? And then I was thinking about this book. People of my generation might recognise this book, Z for Zachariah by Robert O'Brien. This was a book that was regularly pressed into the hands of teenagers in the 70s, 80s, and I believe early 90s. It's quite an interesting book. It's, it would be called Young Adult these days. And it's about this young girl in a post-apocalyptic, post-nuclear world. She's the only survivor. And she's in this valley that somehow, through meteorological conditions, has survived. And then a man in a radiation suit comes in, and he's clearly unhinged. And at one point he rapes her in a quite, quite disturbing scene for a, for a teenage novel. It was a hugely important book for many teenagers. I remember it vividly. I never hear of it anymore. I wonder if teenagers are still given this book. It's a very good piece. It's a very uh, intelligently written piece for young people. You know, it's not a great work of literature, but it's, it's a powerful novel that gets its point across well. I just wonder... If, do people read this anymore? Is it, is it forgotten? I don't hear about it. Let's bring it up now to the early 20th century. Now, if you were going to, went to any European household, up until 70, 75, from the start of the 20th century, and you asked them, who is the definitive English writer? Do you know the answer they would give? Rudyard Kipling. Oh yes, they would. And Kipling was widely read in Europe. The Just So Stories, Kin. He was the definitive English novelist. He summed up Englishness. But Kipling now is not read and is not very popular with educational authorities, universities and so on. Now, with Kipling, we kind of know why, don't we? Kipling is seen by the modern generation as the absolute avatar of imperialism, colonialism, racism. I'm going to read you a poem by Kipling. It's called The Stranger. The stranger within my gate, he may be true or kind, but he does not talk my talk, I cannot feel his mind. I see the face and the eyes and the mouth, but not the soul behind. The men of my own stock, they may do ill or well, but they tell the lies I am wanted to. They are used to the lies I tell. And we do not need interpreters when we go to buy and sell. The stranger within my gates, 
He may be evil or good, but I cannot tell what powers control, what reasons sway his mood, nor when the gods of his far-off land shall repossess his blood. The men of my own stock, bitter bad they may be, but at least they hear the things I hear and see the things I see, and whatever I think of them and their likes, they think of the likes of me. This was my father's belief, and this is also mine. Let the corn be all one sheaf, and the grapes be all one vine, ere our children's teeth are set on edge by bitter bread and wine. I think you see the problem. It speaks for itself. Imagine putting that poem before a modern class of teenagers. But what's interesting is, here's my volume, my huge volume of the collected poems of Rudyard Kipling. Um, I have to be honest, I don't much care for Kipling's poetry, if I'm going to be very honest about it. I find most of it unreadable. But it's so interesting to go back to and look at because it opens up, only just a hundred years ago, a whole treasure chest of English thought and nature and culture which has vanished. I mean, all these backroom ballads, these soldiers' ballads, you know, repeating the cockney phrases of the soldier fighting, you know, in foreign lands. But what I find interesting in this volume is only a few pages after that poem, The Stranger, which, uh, you know, is uh, interesting, we have the poem that is regularly voted the favourite poem of the nation in this country, in popular polls. Let's read it. It's called If. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools, if you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss, and lose, and start again at your beginnings, and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with sixty seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and, which is more, you'll be a man, my son. So that is the favourite poem, regularly voted for by British people, only a few pages after The Stranger. Isn't that interesting? Shouldn't that give us pause that those two poems come from the same sensibility? But we don't think that, do we? One we discard, one we take to our bosom. I wonder if that isn't reflective of all of these writers I've been discussing in this video. Are we too dismissive of those aspects which no longer mean anything to us or which conflict with our values? And then there's so much that we're losing, that so much that we're throwing away. Another figure similar to this is Evelyn War, a writer I admire very much. Now, again, if you'd been around, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, early 60s in Britain. Who was the great novelist of the day? Evelyn Waugh. Everyone would have said it. There's even a scene in the British drama series Foyle's War, which is set during the Second World War. It's a detective series set during the Second World War. And there's a scene where Michael Kitchen, the main character, in a little scene, he gives a birthday present to a friend. It's a novel by Evelyn Waugh, and they both say how much they like him. You see, that's a little sign of how important Evelyn Waugh was to the whole culture. He wasn't just for the literary buffs. He was a major figure. But Waugh was a massive Tory. Uh, you know, he celebrated sort of aristocratic and upper-middle-class life. 
He had a very bitter, cynical, cold, icy view of society that doesn't at all chime with where Britain is now. You go into any bookshop in London, war is still in print. All his books are still in print. But I wonder how much read they are. Brideshead Revisited is still highly read, and that is still one of my favourite novels of all time. But what about the Sword of Honour trilogy and things like Scoop? Are they still read? I'm not sure. Those are some names to conjure with. I'd be interested to know if there's any other writers, and also from other countries apart from Britain, that you feel that were major figures in your youth and you heard about them all the time, but now never get talked about. In making this video, there were so many names I came across. Hazlitt, Charles Lamb, Byron. Is Byron read very much, much more? Southey, Dryden, John Dryden. Dryden invent, you know, was the person who's, um, he's given credit for the heroic couplet. Is it the heroic couplet? Um, as being one of the, the sort of the foundation of English poetry. He was a huge figure in Restoration England and for a whole century afterwards. Massive influence on Alexander Pope. Who reads Dryden anymore? Congreve, William Congreve, John Betjeman, Jeremy Bentham. There's so many of these writers. I feel we're losing them. And I wonder if we're losing them for the right reasons. Let me know your thoughts below and let any names that you can think of, I'd be interested to hear. Thanks very much.